Where light and shade repose, where music dwells lingering and wandering on as loath to die, like thoughts whose very sweetness yieldeth proof that they were born for immortality. They dreamt not of a perishable home who thus could build. And talking of perishable homes, William Wordsworth, thou shouldst be living to coin a phrase at this hour. This little perishable home, a caravan used for serving dainty teas, is the first glimpse that thousands of people have of Cambridge when they arrive by bus. This useful amenity is set right in the heart of the town with Christ College on one side and Emmanuel on the other. And behind me, and stretching almost from one college to the other, is the sort of thing that's beginning to happen in Cambridge today. The sort of thing that happens when a college disposes of its land and a speculative developer moves in. Though somebody has tried very hard here, somebody has realised that this is in fact Cambridge renowned for its courts. And so there is here a shopping court with an arched entrance flanked by pillars. It might have been quite impressive if it hadn't been only a few hundred yards from the real thing. A few hundred yards from the courts of King's College. It seems that whatever happens to the town itself, these unique courts and buildings remain secure. But what about the town itself? So many university people have said that Cambridge is the perfect university town. I wonder how many visitors see it that way. How many do anything but just look at the college spires? How many look at the spires and steeples of the town itself and what lies beneath them? Well, to be fair, there aren't any other views exactly like that in the centre of Cambridge, and not many visitors would come across this street anyway. But they do all go into the town centre with its commerce and culture. What, in fact, do they see? At first sight, Cambridge might be any other town, sometimes over-anxious to keep the public well informed. Just wander on through the Cambridge streets, and you might suppose, from some of the evidence, you were almost anywhere in East Anglia. Very soon you find hints that this is, in fact, a tourist town. For the really observant, there are special offers here and there of the narrower trouser that goes with the broader and younger mind, who like an evening of squatting and contemplating their nameless dreads. Young people, it's clear, have their problems here as they do everywhere, but at least the students of today are beginning to get the buildings they deserve. At a safe distance across the river, contemporary thinking is bringing back the fire station of the 30s as the students' fashionable living accommodation of the 60s. And it won't be long before human beings are placed inside this base, pointed at the sky and fired with enthusiasm. It is, in fact, an ingenious lecture hall designed by Sir Hugh Casson and Neville Conder, and it could only happen in a university town bursting with people young enough to care about being with it and living in the very latest pop architecture. Of course, it's buildings you think of first when you hear the words perfect university town. You think of large-scale courts and buildings leading to small-scale, almost village-like streets. Cambridge is not quite like that, but I imagine the people who are fond of the place remember only the bits they want to remember. And after a time, I'm sure, they think that a walk round Cambridge is exactly like this. Not great architecture, but streets where the different heights and styles of buildings look exactly right as a contrast to the monumental colleges. Streets where you can escape from the noise and smell of traffic and plunge into little alleyways leading to bookshops and restaurants and stretching away behind churchyards into cottagey lanes. Again, not much in themselves architecturally, but the best that's been left behind in modern Cambridge. Lanes that run into each other, the perfect places to browse at small shop windows or to sit looking out from a coffee shop. The lucky ones still live in these quiet passageways in the town centre, instead of in the hideous suburbs on the outskirts. Now, some of the houses are neither very old nor very beautiful, but they have what estate agents like to call character. And some of those with real character and history, like these cottages frequented by Samuel Pepys for reasons which had nothing to do with his more formal education, are pleasantly broken by passages leading into college courts. This is all the dream Cambridge, and there's not many more than half a dozen streets like these left today outside the college gateways. And those that do remain are only as close together as that in the imagination or the eye of a camera that's prepared to be kind. In a less amiable mood, you could remember the town much more easily like this. This is a very recent contribution to the streets of Cambridge, and although it would hardly disgrace a suburb like Penge, even Penge would have to admit that Cambridge deserves rather more special treatment. 
Again, it's a glimpse of what happens when college land is built on in the supermarket style of architecture. A style that's a bit more brazen than the familiar architecture of the multiple stores, the sort of buildings that make a town look like any other town. Commercial palaces in neoclassical styles instead of modest, gabled, villagey shops. And one of these chain stores has a delicate shade of mauve instead of its usual cheerful bright red frontage, just as if a change of colour could possibly make it more acceptable in a place known all over the world for its fine college architecture. And some of this stuff's been here so long that you wonder exactly when, if ever, Cambridge was the perfect university town, not dominated by the buildings of commerce. Just occasionally you find a bit of pseudo-Georgian which doesn't look too overpowering. Like so many Cambridge buildings, it's the work of the 1930s. But it's not so much the phony qualities of this sort of thing that's a pity in the tourist paradise of the Fenlands, it's the size of it. The hulking great chunks of brick and stone that long ago started to accumulate around the colleges. Come away from this particular row of inoffensive looking houses and you're really walking away from a monstrous piece of architecture which makes an ordinary line of shops look like a place suitable only for the signing of peace treaties, with about as much charm as an atomic power station. But charm is something you can so often see was once there in this town. It was lost in this crescent, one of the few pedestrian lanes, when the prison-like wall of Keyes College went up on one side of it. The colleges have, in fact, played almost as big a part as the county and the town in spoiling Cambridge over the years, often because they all had their own ideas of how to keep it as pleasant as the travel books like us to think it really is. Even in these enlightened days, when everything is done with the careful supervision of planning experts, this sort of thing can happen in what's left of a small residential area near the tower of St John's College. If the town and the county and the colleges had not been disagreeing for so many years about what they wanted, there'd probably be a better way of handling cars than putting them into something like this. Cambridge can't afford to build again today the clumsy structures it was landed with by the 19th century. But this sort of thing can come down, and it will. And so will the equally undistinguished 19th century corn exchange. With its almost instinctively unerring aim, Cambridge seems to have missed even the best of Victoriana. But at least there's a lot here that's very worth pulling down. When it is down, will the new buildings have anything of the pleasant village scale that's still to be found even in the shabbiest of the smaller streets? Or will the tourists of the year 2064 be equally stunned by unexpected views of the previous century's work? The answer will be given in this part of the town just opposite this massive elevation. This is not the most exciting part of Cambridge, but it is a very important place. It's the one place where Cambridge seems to know exactly what it's trying to do. This is Lion Yard, at present a car park, where both the city and the county want to build the beginnings of a new centre for arts and for shopping, a centre that would include the existing marketplace and the existing shopping area. And all this area would become a pedestrian precinct. Now, there seems a good chance that they'll get exactly what they want. And even if the city architect doesn't get the underground through roads that he dreams of, it's likely that there will be some underground roads, particularly here in Lion Yard. Now, there is one awful warning for Cambridge just here. On the edge of the yard, this ghastly 19th century building is being replaced by a new science block, which was to have been a skyscraper, but is getting shorter at every planning inquiry every few months. It has seemed here that Cambridge is so obsessed with the fear of building high that it overlooks the very real dangers of building sideways. This building, for instance, not so very many years old, is just the kind of thing that could happen again today. A great straggling frontage broken only at ground level by shop windows. If anyone remembers how on earth it happened, maybe they can remember too why this appalling guild hall thrust itself onto the opposite side of the market square or why, even more recently, this strange building tried to look like the Cotswolds running amuck in the heart of East Anglia. How is it, you wonder, that anyone's worrying today about skyscrapers when these dull cliffs were long ago allowed to slam themselves up against Christ's College? And when Christ's College, in fact, has adopted this brand new neighbour on the other side? These are all reminders that even if Cambridge does get the perfect plan for its centre, it still has to find architects who will give it buildings of the right quality and the right scale. There are, in fact, in Cambridge now, three outstanding examples of what can be done. 
This bank in the marketplace couldn't be more modern, but it's been designed by the architect's co-partnership to sit quietly among its older neighbours. Among the colleges, there's no better display of ways of blending old buildings with new than the additions made to a riverside site for Magdalen College. The architect, David Roberts, not only preserved cottages once threatened with demolition, but he also added to the charm of their broken roof lines and their varying heights with his own brand new buildings. And the students who live in them live in their own small village. Magdalen's housing is very different from this formal courtyard at the other side of the town. A demonstration by the architect Eric Lyons that one of the qualities of the great Cambridge College architecture can be brought even to, to a modern housing estate. Here, it's not so much the buildings themselves that are so well worth looking at as the spaces, the landscaping in between them. Every architect who does anything at all in Cambridge ought to be compelled to live for a while in a flat overlooking this serene courtyard until he understands the meaning of scale, proportion, and architectural good manners. Before leaving Cambridge, it's nice to be reminded not only that our new buildings can be as good as some of the old ones, if not better, but also that our planners are still anxious to preserve our crumbling heritage. And so, as we say farewell to Cambridge, gateway to America for British scientists, let's be grateful that this venerable pile is scheduled for preservation. A building that was not thought worthy of being put into the town centre, but which is nostal nostalgically remembered by thousands of students. Again, in the words of the poet, they don't build buildings like that today. <laughs>